Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Linda. I'm your first aider for today. So I'm going to go through today. We're going to talk about looking at adult choking. But before we do that, we just need to go through some health and safety rules. So today, um, there shouldn't be a fire alarm, hopefully not, because um, we had a fire sort of alarm sort of tester on Monday. But there may be a fire alarm. If it does go off, it is potentially a fire. So therefore, we do need to exit the building quietly and safely. Um, just take yourself, don't pick up anything else. And we're going to congregate in the car park. Um, toilet and kitchen facilities, there are some toilet and kitchen facilities just through the door, turn left. It is a bit of a narrow corridor. So I would ask, because of the COVID um, risk um, assessment that we need to make sure that you don't all congregate in that room. So if you wouldn't mind, if we could just have one person at a time go into that room, make your tea and coffee, obviously keep it nice and clean and tidy. And then as they come out, the next person can go in. Um, with COVID, when we're working in pairs, um, obviously please make sure that you have your barriers on, which is your gloves, um, your masks, try to stay, if you can, wherever possible, two metres apart. But obviously, I know because we are actually doing some first aid um, things that the, you may not be able to always keep that social distancing. But at all times, just try the best you can, really. And then equipment wise, what we're going to use today is our dummies. And I've got another one here that's actually got one of the um, chest thrust vests on as well. So if one of you wants to use that, you can. I'm going to use that one to demonstrate. But with your dummies, what I would ask you to do, I am going to put you in pairs a bit later on, is I would like you to make sure that you use your dummy and the other person can then just observe them just working with that dummy. OK, any questions, anyone? Good. <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm just going to quickly, let me just find my sheet. One minute, guys. Sorry about this. Just got to flick through. So these are the aims and objectives of the session today. So what we're going to do today is we're going to identify and provide the correct first aid protocol for a mild airway obstruction. So that's the first thing we're going to look at. The second thing we're going to look at is identifying and providing again the, the correct first aid protocol for a severe airway obstruction. Then we're going to look at some potential adap adaptations or things we may need to do with various people. So we'll have a discussion about that. And then finally, what we're going to do is identify and provide the correct first aid um, protocol for someone that becomes unconscious and is choking. Yeah. So from here, what we're going to do now is we need to really understand what is choking. So I've done a really, don't laugh at my diagram because it's not the greatest. I think if you understand a bit of the anatomy of the throat, it makes it a little bit more clearer about what could potentially go wrong and why someone might choke. So if you look here, we've got the pharynx, which is the pipe here. So it goes, when you take food into your mouth and you swallow, it goes down through, there's the back of the tongue, it goes there, down through into the pharynx. It then goes down the esophagus and then it goes into the stomach. Now, we've also got here, you can you see that pipe here, which is a cartilaginous pipe, which is your trachea. So you've got your voice box and then the trachea here. What can sometimes happen, if you see here, I've done like a little red mark there. Can everyone see that okay? Yeah. I know it's a bit small because my diagram was a bit small. This is your epiglottis. Now your epiglottis is a bit like a little trap door. So it opens and it closes, so it does this action. It does that, so it senses when you're having food or drink and it lifts up when you're taking air in, but it drops as you start to take the food and drink in. So it blocks off the trachea in the hope that you don't take food down into that area because the trachea is your main airway. That's where air goes in. Now, sometimes this trap door, it's quite good to think of it a bit like a little trap door, sometimes doesn't op operate potentially as quickly as we would like it to 
or you know we may be eating and rushing so what can sometimes happen is that little trap door doesn't close quick enough and then what can potentially happen is the food will then go down instead of into the pharynx first and then down into the esophagus it then goes into the trachea and then it get, gets lodged into that airway pipe and this is where we start to have the symptoms of choking. So anyone can answer, what do you think, who could be quite susceptible to choking? Old people. Yeah, old people, because again, you know, their reflexes are not as good, they're starting to get older. It could be, anyone think of anything else? Children. Children, yeah, because children is really difficult, isn't it? Because they pick up things, and actually with children, it might not necessarily be food, it could be small, toys etc which is why we always have those sort of warning signs on toy toys to make sure that with particularly younger children sort of infants and then young children that you don't have these small toys around because they love to test things and put things in their mouths um, other people other people you need to sort of think about sort of dentures for older people that can cause problems um, any degenerative um, neurological disorders again that can affect um, how quickly that trap door opens and closes, Parkinson's disease, um, stroke. There's all various people that you need to consider um, when it comes to looking at choking. So what we're gonna do now is we're going to look at a mild airway obstruction. So actually, I might just write on the bottom of here. So mild airway obstruction she says try and put a pen in let's just do that so mild airway obstruction so we're going to look at the signs and symptoms of this so if you come across someone that's had a mild airway obstruction you will notice that they are quite they're coughing quite violently because what they're trying to do is get this piece of food or whatever obstruction there is in the trachea out as quickly as possible. They, so you'll see coughing. Um, they can speak, they might be able to speak, but not much. I mean, you'll hear sort of words, but no, it might just be one word. Yeah, like, I need help or something. Yeah, so, you, they, so they can speak. So if they can speak, what can you assume from that? Breathe. That they can breathe, exactly. So the fact that they can still breathe, um, speak means that they are still managing to get some air in, so therefore they can speak. So the protocol that we need to follow for this is that we do nothing. So we must not, so it's no chest compressions, I'm just going to do that. And no abdominal thrust because you could potentially make the situation much worse. So this is for a mid airway obstruction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of enact the protocol that you need to follow as a first aider to someone that you come across that has got this mid mild airway obstruction. Okay, so First of all, if you have barriers, then do put them on. Obviously, if you're out, it doesn't matter, you might not have these, yeah? But the first thing you would do is you would come up to us and you see, so imagine he's coughing away, and you would go up to them and go, hello, my name's Linda, I'm a first aider, can I help you? And you will see them coughing and desperately trying to get some air in, and they may just, they may just nod and just go, yeah, I need some help. So in this instance, you would say, can I help you? And then the words I want you to say is, are you choking? And if they say this, you know they can speak. So you therefore can then decipher and say, okay, this is just mild. So then what you do is you just stand back, you stay there and you assess the situation and monitor it. So you keep a good close eye on what's actually going on because the problem with choking is, it could potentially deteriorate. So therefore that might mean that you need to step in. So you just monitor them, they'll be coughing, they'll probably be bent forward, trying to clear. And what you do as a first aid is you just stay with them, 
monitor the situation and you just make them try and cough it up, keep encouraging them and just keep talking to them and just keep nice and calm so that they can just keep going as much as they can with the coughing and trying to clear the object. Yeah? So that makes sense, everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Good. So now what we're going to do now is we now look at the next stage that this person could potentially go into. So the next stage is your severe airway obstruction. Let me just do this. Sorry, Tommy. Do, 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 do. It's all right, though. I'll just go here. So we're now going to look at severe airway obstruction. So with severe airway obstruction, this is where the airway is completely blocked. So therefore they cannot talk, they will look quite panicked, um, they may be clutching their throat or they may be pointing to their throat. Um, the universal sign for choking is both hands to the neck and they're holding towards their neck. They could be leaning forward, they could be frantically pointing, they will be doing anything they can to try and get your attention to get some help. However, they will still be conscious. So there may, they are still just about still breathing, but they're not really because this is completely lodged in there. So with this scenario, it's very obvious that they are, that's it, it's really, really lodged in there. They can't breathe, they can't talk, they're in quite serious trouble. Now with this scenario, you need to act quite quickly but also the one thing that you should try to remember to do is phone the emergency services because this scenario could potentially go downhill quite quickly. And what you want to do is have those emergency services potentially on board before that situation occurs. So with this, what we're going to do is we're going to start to do five back blows. So if we go severe, we've got can't breathe, Yeah, they, um, they've got their hands to their throat, hands to their throat. What else did I say? Can't spell. They look frantic, panicked, yeah. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do five back blows. And we're going to do five abdominal thrusts, yeah. Now, when you're doing this, you can, it depends really on your height and things like that. Um, I might do it sort of with the person sitting down. They could be standing up. If you're standing up, what you want to do is have your one leg in between that person, one leg to the other side. Make sure you've got a good base of support with your legs. Yeah, if you go quite close to your legs, you could potentially topple over. So just make sure you've got a good wide base so that you can get good steady hold onto that person. Um, you could have them in a chair, or we'll talk about some other ideas of how to do it if you're still struggling with that. So again, what you need to do is make sure you have your barriers on, if you have them. You have called the emergency services because this person is now in a life-threatening situation. And then from there, again, you introduce yourself if you've just walked in on this scene. You'll say, Linda, I'm a, uh, hello, uh, my name's Linda, I'm a first aider. Can I help you? Now, obviously, they can't speak. But if they're going like that or they nod their head, then you can take that as consent that they are asking you for help. So now from here, what you're going to say is you talk them through what you're actually going to do with them because, again, it will calm them. It will make them realise that you potentially know what you're doing, yeah, and so therefore they will then be more, less resistant to the treatment that you're actually giving them. So what we're going to do is, I'm going to take, so what I'm going to do with this dummy is I'm going to turn it round, just so you can see the back blows, 
and then I'm going to turn it around and do the abdominal thrust yeah but obviously you wouldn't be doing that if you were doing that with a person so I'm going to turn this round what you want to do is you want to take your arm and take it around the abdominal area I'm just going to bring it a bit higher because I need to lean this forward and then you want them to lean forward so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it up here for now just for this bit from here you want to hit with the heel of the hand with the fingers facing up towards the head in between the shoulder blades and you're going to do five back slaps quite firm each time you do it I need you to look around and check to make sure that you're not just back slapping just for the sake of it and that the obstruction is still in there or it has cleared so we're going to go one check two three keep checking four five then obviously that patient will still be there you're then going to do the abdominal thrust now the abdominal thrust you're going to take your fist you're going to do the thumb side is going to go below the sternum and in between the tummy button can everyone see that so it's not too low not too high yeah so it's just below the sternum just above the tummy button from there you're going to place the hand there you have the patient still leaning forward slightly you get behind them you get the other hand on top and the action you want to do is an inwards and upwards thrust and the reason you do that is because you want to try and get the diaphragm to push up and push the air out so from here you go and again you need to check one two three and there that obstruction's come out yeah if the obstruction hasn't come out then you continue with the back blows and the abdominal thrusts so remember I said to you about there may be scenarios where you may need to consider other ways of delivering the abdominal thrust. So is there any people you could think of that might need a slight change in the way you might administer these? Really big, so yes, so if you've got you. yeah, so if you've got quite a big overweight person, what you may need to do or to consider is placing them up against a wall. Yes, yeah, so if I just go there and you may need to deliver them from the front. So you would still do here, but it would actually be that side of my fist that would actually be pressing in. So you'd be there and you would lean into it and then push in and up. Yeah, so you could use that method. The other people you need to consider is someone who is potentially pregnant because obviously you can't press into the abdominals that way. So what you would do is then do a little bit higher. So it would be just below the sternum and again it's that inward and upward action yeah so it wants to be higher and obviously not in that abdominal region so what we're going to do now everyone is we're going to practice in pairs so what we'll do is the back row so jake will down you're going to observe the front row so just make sure you've got your barriers on there is the dummy there that's got the um the little what's it that pops out yeah so first group you're going to do it the others are going to observe so we're going to administer so this is for severe airway obstruction so you're going to administer your five back blows and then your five abdominal thrusts do about one or two rounds and then swap over and I'll come around and help you that's it Oh, good. <laughs> Very good, Tommy. Think more, um, Scott, go more in and up. Go in first and then pull up. Even deeper in. It's quite hard on that. I don't think he's got one in there. <laughs> Bit more in. That's it. There you go. Perfect. Very good. It's quite awkward, isn't it? It's quite hard to sort of balance. <laughs> That's it.
Go if you can, shall I go a little bit lower, just a touch, and go more hand. That's it. A bit harder. Good. There you go. Marvellous. Very good. Anyone else need to have a go? Good, Darren, that's it. Good. Uh, just try and study it a bit, Will, and then think more in and up. A bit harder, so more in, if you can. That's it. Perfect. There we go. Good, everyone. How did you find that? Okay. Yeah, good. So the last thing we're going to look at is someone that is unconscious choking. So what you may find is whilst you're doing that, and say the obstruction is not clearing, this you may feel that person become limp in your hands and your body, their body start to slump. This is them now classed as clinically dead. Yes, yeah? so they have now completely stopped breathing. There's no oxygen getting into their body and therefore we now need to act very, very quickly. If you haven't already called the emergency services, you must do so now. And if there is a bystander by, then ask them to please do this. Again, you need to ask, even though they're unconscious, you may have walked into this, you still need to say, hello, my name's Linda. You need to tap them, ask consent. Yeah, let me just get, where's my dummy? And this now, the protocol for this is now you go into CPR, but just the chest compression. So from here you go, hello, hello, my name's Linda. I'm a first aider. Are you okay? Can you talk to me? Nothing, yeah? You have asked someone, someone said they've been choking, they've collapsed. So you're going to tip them back, their head back. So you go the head tilts, chin back. And you check in the mouth to see if there's any obstacles in there. If you can, if you do see it, then you can take them out. But don't do a blind finger sweep. It's really important you don't do that. And then from there, you then start to do the chest compressions because you're hoping that the pressure will push um, the obstacle out. So from here, you go heel of the hand, have a hand on top. It's in between the breastbone and the two nipples and slightly down. And then you do 30 compressions to go... And then you just check to see if there's anything in the mouth and if there is and you do feel you can get it out then you do put your fingers in just try and gently take it out if not and you can't see anything do not put your fingers in there so that's for unconscious choking so you carry on with that until the emergency services arrive so just to summarize what is mild airway obstruction what's the protocol as a first aider you would need to follow yes and if we did the severe obstruction, what's the protocol you would need to follow? <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you would need to potentially consider doing? CPR. Calling emergency. emergency services. And then lastly, unconscious, what would you need to do? Yeah, and again, if you haven't already done so, call the emergency services. Yeah? yeah? yeah. Good.